Oncology on skin cancer, particularly melanoma. Uh, somehow the first uh, indication for the revolution in immunotherapy uh, and I think now with the uh, progress in adjuvant therapy it is again uh, a paradigm for the development of new medications uh, in other cancer types. So uh, the title of this uh, uh, session is, includes also patient cases uh, and uh, with this I would really like to start with a, with a case that we have seen recently. So you know that we are uh, treating many patients in the context of clinical trials and there are now many combination trials ongoing. Well, this patient, this quite young patient uh, with metastatic melanoma was included in a clinical trial investigating pembrolizumab alone or in combination with the IDO inhibitor Ipacadostat. So I come back to this uh, group, uh, to this target and to the medications in this context later on. Uh, and uh, he started this treatment in December 2016, tolerated it very well. Uh, but unfortunately, this patient did not respond. So we had a, a very pronounced progressive disease. You can see here a lot of additional metastasis in lung, but also bone metastasis. Though since this patient was um, uh, mutate, showed a mutation for BRAF V600E and was rapidly progressing, we immediately started uh, another treatment, and he was. Uh, treated with, an, with a targeted therapy with a BRAF and MEK inhibitor, vimorafenib and cobimetinib. And this treatment, uh, unfortunately, was not well tolerated, so he had a very severe systemic inflammatory reaction. So you see here that his skin, so he had a very significant rash. He had hypotension, tachycardia, diarrhea, he had increased liver functions, and he had systemic inflammatory uh, signs such as LDA, CRP, and also uh, uh, new vent ventricular extrasystoles. And in this situation, we now routinely uh, measure serum cytokine levels, and you can see there's an elevated level for uh, IL-6 and interferon gamma. So here also the disease cause is shown, and we, we diagnose based on, based on the symptoms, uh, something that is known in hematology pretty well, which is called cytokine release syndrome, so a systemic inflammatory response driven by innate uh, immune mechanisms. And at this time, uh, we treated these patients with high-dose corticosteroids and intensive uh, supervision. Some of these pa patients go also to intermediate care units, to, uh, especially if there are cardiac problems. So quite an intensive and long uh, period of corticosteroids. Um, uh, and uh, in this situation, actually it's always a question, what is this patient suffering from a drug allergy? And there are severe drug allergies that even can call, cause complete detachment of the skin and can be life-threatening. Or is this an uh, uh, immune response that is associated with the treatment and also caused by on-target effects? Uh, to, we believe in this situation that these are, this is a cytokine release syndrome that is similar to, to things that you see uh, with CAR cells or with bispecific antibodies. And therefore, we reintroduce the same medications in these patients carefully. We slowly increase the dose. And this is what we have de done in this patient, though this patient obviously did not suffer from a drug allergy but from a, from a cytokine release syndrome, uh, and he obviously uh, profited a lot. So why do I tell you this? So nowadays, many patients go from immunotherapy to targeted therapy, and in this phase, we have an overlap of actually four, at least three different drugs, sometimes four different drug, drugs. Imagine if a patient has ipilimumab and, and uh, nivolumab, and then is switched to targeted therapies within two weeks, he still has uh, high levels of the checkpoint inhibitors in the blood. So we have at the same time four different medications on work and this is associated with, with an increased uh, uh, frequency of very systemic uh, side effects. Uh, and you might also know that uh, both treatment strategies, targeted therapy and uh, immunotherapy are nowadays combined. So we have clinical trials that 
uh, investigate the contribution of PD-1 therapy in the context of targeted therapy. So one of the trials that is ongoing is uh, sponsored by Novartis using their anti-PD-1 antibodies, Bartalizumab, uh, in combination with the targeted therapy. And I can show you here data from the, from the uh, from a sub-cohort of this clinical trial uh, investigating the tolerability and the feasibility of this clinical trial. And you see here this waterfall plot. And actually, this is the first waterfall plot that does not have a patient that, that is not really uh, responding, or at least most patients, so uh, uh, more than 80% of the patients show a decrease in the, in the tumor burden, and there is no patient who just progresses. So these are really very, very promising data. And in this clinical trial, we had also a, bi a, a cohort uh, that was investigated very careful for biomarkers. Uh, and connected to the case, I want to show you this graph. It's a little bit complicated. So these are patients treated with anti-PD-1 and in combination with a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. And you see here, you here you see the effect of the therapy. So this is the decrease of the tumor burden. So all patients showed an improvement. Then you see during the treatment the change in the plasma gamma interferon. And you see the change of the CRP. So gamma interferon is a cytokine that is produced by T cells. So here we have a marker that shows us the activity of uh, the T cell populations. And CRP is a marker for innate immune responses. So you, here you have a marker for uh, uh, unspecific immune reactions. So we want to have the specific one and the un uh, unspecific ones. And still it's a small population, but what, what you can see, the patient is profiting most if he has a very pronounced activation or an increase in gamma interferon, so activation of adaptive immune responses, and associated at the same time with a reduction of immune responses. So this shows that during immunotherapy, not all immune functions are regulated in the same way, and this offers a lot of opportunities for treatment options. So you can reduce uh, uh, innate immune responses without affecting uh, adaptive immune responses, and it might be even be beneficial to neutralize innate immune responses. So there are a number of papers, for example, on anti-TNF strategies that also are used for patients uh, with uh, bowel complications during ipilimumab. So the addition of anti-DNF has a beneficial impact on the interaction of T lymphocytes and tumor cells. So I think in the future, this will be one of the strategies that we really try to re reduce uh, systemic immune reactions. And you might also know that patients with an elevated LDH and a high CRP and a leukocytosis or eosinophils, any eosinophils elevated in the blood, they respond typically uh, less uh, uh, than patients who have no inflammatory systems. So, the two, so in my opinion, the dissection between innate uh, and adaptive immune responses is very beneficial and offers additional strategies. So we start now to use anti-IL-6 in these patients as it is done in cytokine release. Or also we consider to investigate anti-IL-1 beta strategies. So with this, we, we, we go uh, and, and recapitulate a few data that we have achieved in, in immunotherapy. So we know that with our treatment strategies, we can interfere at different uh, po uh, uh, positions of the uh, cancer immunity cycle, but we have to be always aware that all this, the, the checkpoints and the uh, mechanisms are somehow connected, so we cannot change this uh, 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 cycle without affecting other parts. So what can we, so what, what is proven over the last years? So I think we can state that the combination of, of targeted, uh, of two an, uh, immune antibodies checkpoint inhibitors here, nivolumab and ipilimumab, have a benefit. So we see that a subgroup of patients have more uh, efficacy, and this is uh, reflected by an increased response rate, by a prolonged progression-free survival, and also by a higher proportion of patients surviving. After three, and at ESMO, we will, be, we will see the four-year survival data. 
So there is a benefit, however, there is a, a, a toxicity difference. So this combination is by far less tolerable than the monotherapy. So it's our task to identify patients that only need the monotherapy. And there are, just in the literature here from Nature this year, uh, a very interesting data on a special subtype of melanomas, which is called the desmoblastic melanoma. This is a melanoma that is associated with lentigo maligna. Lentigo maligna is a melanoma that is uh, uh, occurring in the UV uh, exposed skin, typically in the face. Though this is a melanoma that has the highest tumor burden. And in this population, you see here in the waterfall blot plots, the response rate for monotherapy with anti PD1 is very high. Uh, so this fits nicely to a, a number of data that we have seen over the last years. Um, still, Two more mutational load is one of the factors that is important, but with the cancer immunogram that was established by Christian Blank and co-workers, uh, we have here a summary of different aspects that are targets. So we mentioned the two more mutational load. We discussed already innate immune responses. So here we ha really have an opportunity by affecting uh, uh, and reducing innate immune responses, IL-6 as a target CRP, as a, as a mirror for the activity. And then there are a number of other points that we have to control if we want to treat all of our patients finally successfully with immunotherapy. So in the uh, um, context of PD-1 resistance, there are a number of factors that we have already identified. And we have, based on these, on these mechanisms of PD-1 resistance, we have now clinical trials that are trying to deal with this. So one of uh, these factors is here called a cold tumor. So this means we have activated T cells, but they are not able to invade into the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and we are here we learned that uh, two different strategies seem to interfere with this. So one is uh, uh, viral therapy. So if we inject the replicating virus into the lesion, we can break this, uh, t uh, this uh, barrier around the tumor and the T cells can influx. And another interesting approach is actually the use of MEK inhibitors. So this is uh, another uh, field where we have learned a lot. We had this case where we had the problems with the simultaneous application of uh, kinase inhibitors and uh, uh, immunotherapy. But I think we should overcome these problems because MEK inhibitors, for example, can be very beneficial. So you know that the MEP kinase pathway is important for the proliferation of the melanoma cells, but you also know that activated T cells need an intact MEP kinase pathway. So by the, the first intuitive idea of you would be if you add a MEK inhibitor, this will have a negative impact on the T cell population. This is correct as, tip, as usual. Yes and no. It is correct in the context of the priming of a T cell. If you add there a MEK inhibitor, the priming is less successful. However, if you come to the effector phase, and this is exactly the problem at, at the PD-1 resistance, if you come at the effector phase, the MEP kinase pathway is driving apoptosis in cells that are overactivated. So by inhibiting the MEP kinase pathway in an effector T cell, you can extend its lifetime and keeps its activity. So therefore, I think the strategy to use a MEK inhibitor together with immunotherapy, especially anti-PD-1, is, is promising and is used now, for example, in many trials of, of Hoffmann-LaRoche uh, in the context of different tumors. The, and the other one is uh, IDO1, an enzyme that is depleting tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid that is essential for the activity uh, uh, of T cells, and therefore IDO1 inhibitors have been investigated in details. And another project that is ongoing in melanoma patients, uh, but also in lung cancers and others, and we have here a very successful cooperation with oncology, are antibodies against Lex3. So these are possible uh, strategies. I just show you a few pictures. So this is a patient uh, with multiple small melanoma metastases, and he was treated with intralesional uh, uh, TVEC, so a replicating herpes virus 
you can see two lesions have been injected, inflammation is everywhere, and these patients can get complete responses. So this was a neoadjuvant trial, so everything was resected later on, and no tumor cells were found, only pigment was left after this treatment. And the combination of, of oncolytic viral therapy together with NTPD1, uh, and these are data from the phase one and phase one B that have been published last year in cell, really show a lot of beneficial uh, uh, um, immune effects that make this uh, uh, approach very promising and we are waiting for the results of the prospective randomized phase three clinical trial. So the IDO inhibitor, so this is, this is a story I think that we should be aware because it's one of the few frustrating stories in, in uh, immune oncology. So I, I mentioned it several times, so IDO1 is an is a enzyme that de depletes tryptophan, uh, and with this it is affecting immune function. Even the uh, metabolites of this depletion of, or these metabolic effects on tryptophan are immunosuppressive. So actually it seems to be a very nice target and it allows also to measure its effect in the serum because you can see the kynurine serum levels and if you treat the patients with an IDO inhibitor you see an impact on this. So it should be a perfect drug target with a PD marker that should be easy to use. Uh, and the development together with NTPD1 in the early phases was extremely rapid and promising and drug target here shown by, by uh, immunoreactivity. So there, this was one of the things that I was concerned. So everything was, everybody was talking about uh, IDO1 activity and the enzyme, enzyme in the melanoma. And you see here staining. And what to realize that there are, there is a, a, a very, uh, low intensity of staining, and these are the tumor cell populations, and then there is a very high expression level, and these are endothelial cells. So I was always a little bit surprised, why is this, is this that the tumors that really should be the source of this molecule are so less expressing, and the endothelial cells are so high? So I don't know, I don't know. We just have to see that ba based on all these reflections and a cl clear PD and so on, we saw a curve like this, with, uh, which we it's very uh, uh, reminiscent to the times when we compared chemotherapy. So actually there is nothing, absolutely nothing. Even if you go for subpopulations, this is an absolutely negative clinical trial in, in melanoma immunotherapy. So just by this, it is a landmark. And we have to learn why this is the case. We have also uh, investigated uh, um, several immune markers in tumors during and, and uh, uh, during targeted therapy or during immunotherapy. And what we see is that pd ligand 1 and IDO1 expression are somehow also uh, uh, overlapping in some patients, but in other patients they are not. So there is a quite a, a wide heterogeneity in, uh, in the local immune profile in these metastases. And obviously we don't understand enough to, uh, to, to create a, a successful drug uh, on IDO1 inhibition today. It might change in the future. And now the, the, the last thing, that, and, and uh, also a very logical step that I think is, is really uh, has huge implications in the management of melanoma in the, the next years. So these are four clinical trials investigating targeted therapy on this side and immunotherapy uh, on the other side in the adjuvant setting, so patients that have completely resected metastatic disease, sometimes different stages, but the, the message somehow is very clear, especially for the three uh, um, clinical trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so we can impact on the outcome of the disease significantly. And if we keep in mind how our patients are treated today, or let's say over the last years, so in the beginning, the first phase is surgery, surgery, surgery. This was, this was the way how we treated these patients. Then we have these unresectable patients that have additional treatment options, radiotherapy, TVAC, interlesional IL-2, and then systemic therapy. But now with all these powerful immunotherapy and targeted therapy approaches, the, the systemic therapy that was reserved for the late stages is really moving more and more into the front. So we do actually no lymph node dissection anymore. 
Instead of this, we do adjuvant therapy, and maybe in the future, or now we already are doing uh, uh, clinical trials in patients with a negative sentinel node. And if you go on in the future, you might even consider, so why do you do surgery at all? So why not treat all the patients right in the beginning and, and just do a diagnostic test, and this can be even surface microscopy. So let's say the management of this patient population has already changed, and we are in the context to write the guidelines again, and I tell you, it's, it's a, a lot of discussions ongoing uh, about the use of, of specialty surgery uh, uh, over the, the treatment history of a melanoma patient. So with this, uh, uh, I see that, I hope I have convinced you how dynamic the field is uh, and how, how important it is to have clinical trials and education and to understand what's going on. And for this, we need biobanks and bioinformatics. Uh, and this work can only be done if the patients are supporting this and therefore we have very close interaction with, with uh, uh, patients group that are really in favor of this type of work. And these are the people that do the job. Thank you for your attention.